Hey, what's going on, guys? How you doing today? Everybody's doing well. Everybody's looking good. Praise the Lord. Yeah, just um, yeah. Make sure you don't miss our uh, our first uh, birthday party. We're gonna have a big cake. I might jump out of it. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, hey, settle down, with ladies. I'm married. Um, well, yeah, guys, welcome to the kingdom, man. It's been awesome. Uh, one other announcement, too, surprise, is um, one of my buddies from South Africa is amazing. I've learned a lot from this gentleman. His name's Andre, Andre Rabbi. Uh, him and his uh, his wife, Mary, will be with us February 26th here Sunday. It's going to be amazing. Man, bring your friends. Tell them how they have to come. Look, I'm not going to preach him up. Go to uh, alwayslove.net and check out some of his content. Go to YouTube, type in uh, uh, Andre and Mar- Marianne Rabe, and man, it's going to blow your mind. February 26th, uh, he, one of my friends emailed me and said that he was a journey to America and um, to preach, and he's going to be here for a month traveling around. He's doing home groups. He's doing churches, and actually, uh, we were able to get in contact with him. I FaceTime with him, and I've been following him for like two years, probably one of the the more, uh, one, probably one of the biggest influences I have on my life and how I read scripture and, um, just, man, just embraces the heart of God when he speaks, man. We're super excited to have him. So make sure you put February 26th. We'll continue to remind you, man, but it's going to be amazing. Um, invite everybody, leaders, whatever you want, man. It's going to be a great day. Do not miss that, um, on top of our birthday, which is going to be the week before, but yeah, man. So I wanted to plug you guys into that. We will continue to remind you, but just put it in your notes and just make sure that you are here that day. Bring all your friends and family. Uh, that's me. You can tell because there's ketchup stains on Mickey Mouse right there. That's how you know it's me. If you ever had a meal, with me ketchup never misses a shirt amen and we don't eat mustard in this household but yeah so thank you guys for coming man welcome to the kingdom um man there's a lot to say today you know today i'm going to talk about something that's not very uh popular in the church but it's probably the biggest theme in scripture and um And here at the kingdom, man, we do an amazing job at being very intentional about building our messages around the finished work of the cross, Jesus and the finished work of the cross. And but we talk very little about what you have to do. And it scares a lot of people because they think that um, through this message, if it's not reinforced by what you have to do after he's done what he's done, well, then you're just selling people cheap grace. And um, it's a grace that would lead you to sin. But when we look at uh, scripture, it says contrary. It says grace is given to produce or to ruin the ungodliness in you. So, I mean, let's just take that conversation today. So um, how many of you know that um, we don't grow fruit by constipation? We don't grow fruit by constipation. If I asked you what the gospel means to you, and you can define it in three words, would the word fun be in there? For a lot of people, it's not. For a lot of people, it's seriousness and striving and faith and all these amazing things. I'm not discounting faith. And I'm not going to discount it today, but I'm going to preach the true faith to you today. And what you're going to see is when you encounter it in your heart, it's going to produce a faith that you couldn't work up in your own measure. And this is a kind of controversial in the church because we, we build ministries based on our faith. And I had one of those. I had a healing ministry for two years, and um, I used to go and heal the sick. And when it happened, I would would take the glory. And when it didn't, I would take the burden and go home and cry. And I would uh, call my colleagues and say, well, Carlos, you just need more faith. Anybody ever been there? You need more faith? And so what do you do? You get into discipline. You get into devotion. You get into self-empowerment. You get into desperation. And you try to get to fill a meter called faith in order to produce greater works. And the thing I think we miss in the church is that because we have tried to have faith and it has worked so somewhat and it has produced a little bit of fruit, what we do is we glorify a method instead of the grace of God in the middle of terrible methods. Just because you've been in ministry and it worked, God's not doing it to advocate or even put an exclamation point on this is the way you do ministry. He's just gracious in the middle of our efforts. <laughs> And if we're not careful, we build theology and, 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 and books about how to do X, Y, and Z based on our procedures instead of his love and his grace. You see, um, I, I, I love when people get healed. I, I'm so thankful for the word of faith movement. It's better than the word of unbelief movement that a lot of churches have. But, you know, if I'm real, I've been in healing meetings. I've seen a bunch of people healed. But statistically, if I can put my, my honest evaluation about it, I am not producing the faith of Christ. I'm not producing the results of Christ. The Bible says that he went and healed everybody who came to him. Everybody he touched got healed. I had a healing conference, and I've seen 60 and 70%, and then I've seen times where there's 20%. And people were frustrated. 
right? And, and the only thing I was told was just to, you know, grow in your faith, Carlos. And, and I did it, and it's, and it's awesome. I'm not shunning that. I'm not shunning your encounter or your experience or your devotion to that. I just want to empower that for you. Is that okay today? So today, I'm not going to talk about your faith. I'm going to talk about the faith of Christ. And you can't, and what you're going to figure out, hopefully in the next 25 minutes, is that you can't have faith independent of Christ's faith, whether you recognize it or not. He says in Hebrews that he's the author and the perfecter of faith. He's the beginning and the conclusion of faith, period. So if any time in your life where it seems like you've been so faithful, yeah, you may have more faith in your procedure, but what it's really come is a revelation of his faithfulness. So we're going to talk about that today because there's people, man, in church that are killing themselves in ministry and living under a very burdensome microscope of not having enough faith. And the best we can give them is like, well, go read more, go fast more, go do ministry more. Go grow this thing called faith. And I want to tell you today that if you want to produce the fruit of Jesus, you have to have the faith of Jesus. And what this does mean, too, is that you're not called to develop your faith like a muscle. You're not even called to have childlike faith. Show me one kid who's produced the works of Christ, and I will have that kind of faith. And when we read that scripture anyway, it's not talking about faith. It's talking about identity. It doesn't say have faith of a child. It says, no, become more like a child. Don't identify with the world, but by, be identified with something else. So you're not here today to grow your faith. You're not here to exercise it like a muscle and take it to the gym and add five more pounds to get faith. I'm going to give you a faith that empowers. A, f- a faith as Jesus comes to proclaim in the middle of the high re- religiosity in the, in the context of what he came. He says, my burden is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So if our conversation around faith doesn't resemble that, we're doing something wrong. Oh, we've missed the object of the affection of faith. So I want to talk to you about that today. And I'm not doing this to limit your faith. I'm not saying that your faith doesn't have a role in there. I'm just going to empower it so you become more faithful by accident. How about that? Instead of living under the barrier of trying to have faith, brother, you must have enough faith and you're not healed because you don't have enough faith and this and this and this. And Jesus never used that excuse. Because you know what? The gospel produces this. When you get born again, whatever you want to describe that as, you get the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Everybody can say yes. Amen. If I told you, okay, now that you're born again, now you got to climb in your way of righteousness, you'd call me a heretic if you knew the gospel. Right? Okay, then it also produces the innocence of Christ. So if I told you that in Christ you're completely innocent by his work, and I saw you out trying to do things to be more innocent, I would rebuke you and tell you, you're believing a false gospel. Holiness. Oh, man. Be holy as I am holy. They couldn't do that, so it had to come through Christ. And now that you're in him, not only do you get his righteousness, his innocence, his holiness. But if I told you, what are you doing fasting like that? Well, I'm trying to become more holy, brother. You're believing a false gospel. So you get the the righteousness of Christ. You get the innocence of Christ. You get the holiness of Christ. You get the authority of Christ. You get the power of Christ. And you know what we don't include in there? Faith. You have all that by grace, but guess what? Your faith has to be sustained and grown like a muscle by your own effort. And I'm here to tell you today that that is a false gospel. You don't grow in faith. You're growing in awareness of the faithful one. And when you have your eyes on the author and the perfecter of faith, it ignites it in you by accident. And now you're moving with faith that works through love instead of faith that works for work's sake. So I'm going to talk to you about that today. I'm going to pin it against scripture. And the scriptures are amazing. And some of the translations, they're written because there was bias in them. And it's okay. But if we don't read scripture, if we don't study, if we don't become like these Bereans, what we do is we're going to limit the power of God in our lives. Because we don't understand. And I can't wait for, I can't wait for this place to get packed with 500 people before I tell you the truth. So I was about to drink my microphone. So let's talk about faith today. But like I said, you know, we do a great job here preaching Christ and what he's done. And we really tell you a little about what you have to do because it's true. And everything that we would do, the works that we are ordained to, not for righteousness, be because of righteousness, are a result of abiding in the dang tree. You can't produce fruit by constipation. You produce it by somebody else's faith, actually. By the faith of the vine, I'm just there abiding. And what the vine labored for, I get to bear. It's an inheritance. You don't earn your inheritance. Your father did. (laughs) You don't earn your inheritance. Your father did. You just shut up and enjoy it and show people so they can see that good father and have the same inheritance. And then you'll be at the top of a hill shining for all the world to see. 
And the message isn't burdensome. It's not get more, have more, do more. It's rest more. It's be convinced more. It's let love love you first more. So let's talk about this today, faith of Christ. I know this is going to ruin a lot of people's theology and probably put people out of ministry if they take it to heart. But there's no other ministry than the ministry of Christ. So let's talk about this today. So in Galatians 2.20, this is probably like one of the, the cornerstones of our faith. We all know this verse. You know, Paul, um, he's actually talking to Peter in, uh, in Galatians. In the book of Galatians, uh, one of the main scriptures that people know is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, that who has bewitched you? Like, who has changed your mind about this? Do you not know, you know, and all these things? And we'll get to that later. But, but the influence that Paul has is, remember, he came from a spirit, from an infrastructure of religiousness, of having your own works for righteousness, of having your own works for holiness, of having your own f- works for innocence and all these things. By the measurement of the law, and then he gets knocked off a horse, spends time with Jesus in the desert, and he comes and flips it on its tail. And not only that, he's sitting down with some of the people who hung out with Jesus. He's with Peter and James, and he goes into Jerusalem. And it's, it's recapping a story that he's saying, but he's coming up to these guys who somehow Peter and James just wanted to be a little more Jewish and that they were paying attention to the more Jewish culture and even though Christ died they had it and they were in the upper room Paul wasn't there and then Paul comes and says hey guys I think we need to recalibrate things and he says this one of the most amazing things he's right before us he says I'm not justified by the works of the law what we'll get into later but he says I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ who liveth in me this is in King James and the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So the whole thing he's trying to tell these Galatians is like, your faith is now a work you've made. And I did that. I was there. I did all the 623 laws. I did all the circumcision, the ceremonial feast. But what I'm here to say is my faith wasn't enough. And now I consider myself dead. I've been co-crucified. I've been co-buried. I've been co-risen. I'm one with Christ. And guess what? I'm not trying to improve my faith. I'm simply living by the faith of the Son of God. The good news is that you don't need your own faith. The good news is that he had to come because you weren't faithful. And literally all of Scripture's entirety, the love story of God, creating mankind, giving them freedom, giving them faith, them losing it, disobedience, God's still faithful. He shows up in Exodus to these people. They're afraid of him. He's led them out of, out of captivity. He's led them through the, the Red Sea. He's conquered the enemy. He's given him manna by day, and they meet him at Mount Sinai, and he wants a relationship He wants his faith to be their faith, but they can't handle it. They want a middleman. They want religion. They want some other representation. You stay up there in your hill, God. We'll get our little man to run back and forth, but don't come close because we're afraid. And even in that, the giving of the law, which God really didn't want, that wasn't his purpose just to give people legality, to keep people in line. He wanted a relationship where if they had just be held to love there, they wouldn't need rules and regulations. So God didn't want that, but he's willing to meet humanity where they are. Like, all right, cool. You don't want a relationship? I don't really want to make this technical, but if that's where you are, I'll give it to you. And even in your delusion and the system you want, I'm still going to be faithful to it. And the people get the law and they become so burdensome. And they're having to do this and this and this and this and this this to earn something that's going to be free in Christ. And then Paul, from the tribe of Benjamin... Studied under Gamaliel, the biggest Pharisee, the biggest worker of the law, comes up and says, man, that wasn't enough. But the good news is, Peter and James, maybe you've missed this, is this, that didn't you forget that you were co-crucified with Christ and it's no longer you who live, but he who lives in you? And guess what? You don't have to have your faith anymore, but now you can live by God's faith. It's a big component of the gospel. This is the announcement. It's the gospel's the declaration not the invitation of what could be true if you just said yes. It's true whether you believe it or not. And when you start believing it, it starts benefiting you. So I'm here, I'm here to tell you today, man, that we're here to preach the gospel. But if I tell you that you get everything else free, holiness, blamelessness, righteousness, power, authority, innocence, but then say that you don't have the faith of Christ, I am preaching to you a false gospel. And what you're going to continue to do is labor for something that's already given freely as a gift. So the whole context of scripture is this. It's a conclusion that now that you're in Christ, you no longer live you. It's him living in you. And now the life you live in the flesh, 
is by the faith of the Son of God. So guys, you don't need your faith. You don't need better faith. You don't need childlike faith. You need the faith of the Son of God. In order to bear the fruit of what Christ bare, you need the faith he had. Not anybody else's. Next ring. So let's talk about this, right? Because in Galatians chapter 3, there's some uh, translations and some articles in and of that need to be corrected. And even the, new, even the King James Version hits us right on as far as tenses and, and ownership of, of nouns and possession and stuff. And then some of the other translations that came from that kind of just get wonky. Not bad. Not, it's not, I'm not saying it's denom, demonic. Don't read your Bible. I'm saying let's put this in context so you can get the romance back. It says this. Galatians chapter 3, Paul's writing to the same person. What did he get through? What did he just finish get through saying? That it's no longer my faith, but I live by the faith of the Son of God. And it says this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ were clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit? Did you receive the born again by the works of the law? or by hearing of the faith? Were you born again? Were you made righteous? Were you made innocent by the list you could do or by a message that brought freedom from that list? The message, the word of faith. Were you justified by your faith or the message that enabled your true faith? You're saved by grace through faith. But you're not saved by your own faith. You're saved by the word that was brought to you that told you about the real faith. And when you trust in that, the liability for your life for justification is no longer under your burden. Because if that's the case and you were saved by your faith, then I got to ask you something. How much faith does it take to be saved? Do you have to be the top 80% of humanity's faith in order to get in? Top 50, top 20. How do you know? How do you know that your faith was sincere enough? How do you know right now you're not sitting in a church of a lot of people and you're the lowest one in the tank? But you said you're saved by faith. Let me ask you, religion always pinpoints. Give me a number. Technically, what must it do to be saved? Top 10, top 20, top 30. And if you endorse that language, that mindset, then you got to live under the microscope of trying to accomplish something that's been accomplished on your behalf. So indeed, you are saved by grace through faith, but it's not your faith that saves you. It's the faith of God that saved you. While you were still yet a sinner, he died for the ungodly. You didn't have it right. You didn't have enough faith, but he did it anyway by his faith. And your faith, or whatever it is you want to call it, is only a magnification of his faith while you are blind. It awakens you and you follow in that manner. But if we don't get this straight, there's people out there trying to have faith. And they're writing books and more books on how you can attain faith. I have one. I have it right here. I wrote a chapter on faith, and a lot of it is against what I wrote. What I'm preaching right now is against what I wrote. And by the way, you can get this on Amazon. Uh, it does feed hungry families, mine, so make sure you get one of those. <laughs> but he says, are you so foolish, having begun the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, and if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Hearing of the message that brings faith. He's not saying, hey, don't have faith. He's saying you're justified by the message that tells you about faith. And then faith isn't even believing, it's trusting. It's not conjuring up a belief mentally that I can agree with it. It's just trusting it. God, I trust that your death and resurrection is the final word about me. I trust it. Let it sleep. Get closure. Because without closure, there's no innocence. Without innocence, there's no intimacy. If it's based on your faith to accomplish something, you're always sitting in fear to where God wants you to be. Because you'll picture his holiness without the holiness he's put inside you. And you're weighing, well, he's just up there and he's super holy and I'm just... Uh, 
And then what you're saying is that everything Jesus accomplished doesn't benefit you anything. What you're saying is, I want my faith. My faith matters in God's conclusion, matters more than God's conclusion. And in that scenario, you're asking God to repent. God believes something about humanity because of what Jesus has accomplished for you and as you without your permission. He believes that. And any moment where we disagree with that and say, no, I just need more faith, you're denying the faith of God that he's given to you as a gift. And you've fallen from grace. This is heavy. This is Galatians 3. This is one of the biggest rebukes in Scripture. And the object of this chapter is faith. I used to have my own faith, but guess what? I got crucified. Even my faith wasn't enough. I've been co-crucified, buried with them. It's no longer I who live, but he who lives in me. And the faith that I used to live by is no longer mine because I live by his faith. Good news. Peter, James, did you forget this? You're trying to whisk up your own faith to impress people. You live by the faith of the Son of God. You don't need your faith. You don't need childlike faith. You don't need somebody else's faith. You need the faith of God. (sighs) Sorry, but... This ruins people in church. People run away from church because they're just like, well, I just can't have enough faith to please God. I agree, you do need faith to please God, but you need his faith to please him. (laughs) My gosh. It's like we're trying to compete against Jesus in a marathon of faith. He's on your team. You're strapped to his back. He's mowing the grass with this economy, huge commercial type of, eight cylinder vacuum and you're like that little thing with the little bubbles that goes pop, 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 pop in the back and you think it's your feet. But he's doing all the work. You're just enjoying it as a toy and walking with a little, what is it called? The little popping lawnmower, pop, pop, pop that little kids do, you know, the little balls pop around. That's what it's like. You're trusting that his job is doing it. You get to celebrate it. You can even think it's your own. But it's him. We preach Jesus and him crucified. That's what him crucified gets you. Man, let's go to the next one. Let's read what the mirror has to say. Anybody gotten to the mirror Bible lately? Oh my gosh, Jesus. I got a lot of rebuke this week from preaching from the mirror Bible, but who gives a rip? Galatians, Galatians, have you completely lost your common sense, your logic? (laughs) Can you see how the law bewitched you and blurred your vision to distort the revelation of what the cross of Christ accomplished inside of you. This was clearly predicted in scripture. How can you not be persuaded by the truth? He did not, Jesus did not die as an individual. He died your death. Please, verse two, would you reason with me on this issue? On the basis, did you receive the Holy Spirit? On, how, on what basis did you receive the Holy Spirit? Are we talking gift language or reward language? What kind of message ignites faith? What a condemned sinner and failure, what a condemned sinner and failure you are as revealed in the law, or what be, God believes about the true you revealed in the gospel? Let's not confuse law with grace. Can you see how stupid it would be to start in the spirit, believing in the success of the cross, and then for some crazy reason, try to switch back into the do-it-yourself-again system? You were given the gift of faith. It's a gift of faith in Corinthians chapter 12. You've been given the gift of faith. And you have it. And that you have it, you're trying to muscle it up again? Are you crazy? He... He put to sleep this do-it-yourself type of game. You couldn't. That's why he had to come as a savior. As if your own works could add anything to what God has already done in Christ, the do-it-yourself system. It would be suicidal. Believing that you got to grow in your faith apart from his faithfulness is clinical depression. I'll diagnose you. People are living in shame, guilt, condemnation, suicidal thoughts. Not that I'm not worth anything. I'm never going to get it right. Man, God's so good. I'm not. What can I do? I'm hopeless. That's the fall of man deluxe. That's what you were born into. And then you hear the good news. And my son, I get it. I understand. I did it for 20 years. 
But then I finally got revelation that it's a gift. I can't earn it. And now I can rest and enjoy and walk, walk with my little popping boop, 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 lawnmower. It's like deliberately jumping out of a boat to try to swim across the ocean. Next one. There are two trees, a do-it-yourself tree or the tree of life. They represent two laws or system. And it says this, the law of works and the law of faith. The one represents that you have to do in order to become. That's the dead one. That you have to do something to become something. That's the language of the law. And the other tree reveals who you are by design and what Christ has done. Because of the Calvary tree, we are free to be. Spirit equals faith. Flesh equals works. Romans chapter 8. Read that one. Remember how you felt when you first encountered faith. Are you prepared to exchange that for religious sentiment? All the ground you've gained would be lost. The law does not complete faith. It nullifies it. You're either living by the faith of the Christ or you're living by an antichrist faith. Oprah's not the antichrist. <laughs> Katy Perry's not the antichrist. It's a system of belief that tells you that you got to earn something that's free. That you got to get something that's already a gift. Would you credit what you have received from God to something you did or something you have heard? The gospel, good news. <laughs> did, you, did God reward you for your high moral standards when he worked extravagant miracles in you and lavished his spirit upon you? Or did it perhaps have anything to do with the content of revelation that the message of grace came that you have heard? Faith is a source of God's, faith is a source of God's action on mankind's behalf. Faith is a source of God's action on mankind's behalf. You know, one of the greatest treasures here, that I get to preach death and resurrection every day of my life. And that's shadowed everywhere in the gospel. You can see it, right? Adam and Eve, right? It was void. And what did it do? God created life. Did Adam have to exalt any type of faith for that to happen? It was by God's faith. He wasn't there. He's there. It was by God's faith he was born. Lazarus, dead in the grave. Lazarus, dead in the grave. Everybody's crying. Jesus shows up. How much faith did Lazarus have to get healed? None. Whose faith was it? Somebody else's faith that healed him. The author and the perfecter of faith showed up and said, that's not the final word. This is. If you die, right here, Done. No heartbeat, nothing. And I come with my breath, like in Genesis, and put it back into you and revive you. Whose faith are you saved by? You're dead. You have no faith. But the author, the perfecter, comes and breathes life into you. When you're dead, you don't have a will. And he gives you life eternal. And it doesn't become real when you say, I'll take, I have enough faith. Just uh, revive me in two seconds. No, he does it anyway. And he puts it in front of you. You can choose not to enjoy it. You can be sorrowful for it. And even rebuke him for creating you in a crazy world. Or you can see it as a gift and start enjoying that, man. He's the author and the perfecter of faith. That means that there's no in-between. He owns all of it. And you can't have faith apart from seeing what he's done through the authorship and the conclusion of faith, period. Faith is a source, God's action. Faith is a source of God's action on mankind's behalf. Our hearing of the good news that you don't got to earn it anymore is a conduit of what God's faith reveals. My gosh, I preach this every week about treasure. Treasure does not become real when you find it. It's always been there waiting to be revealed. Your faith does not make it real. Your faith allows you to be like, oh my gosh, this can benefit me. You're not the author and the perfecter of faith. He is. Your faith is a natural response to his faith already. Do you understand? This, you should take the burden off of trying to grow in faith. It's a rest season. It's a Sabbath. This is good news. Are you guys happy? Yeah. Next. So this is how we should live because of this faith. And there's many times in scripture 
how the righteous shall live by faith, right? It's in, the, it's in the Bible everywhere. Let's go to it. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, very famous. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for in it reveals the righteousness of God from faith to faith. Um, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and for the Greek, for therein, inside the message, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Guys, it is revealed from faith to faith, and that faith is not yours. That word from in the Greek is the word ek, and it always denotes to the source of origin. Look. Where the salvation comes, not just the, the, the perpetual day in heaven where you go to heaven or hell, whatever, but right now, eternal life is made alive when you see the righteousness of God that's, re, that's revealed from the beginning of his faith and your journey of seeing his faith the rest of your life. The more faithful you see God, the more eternal life, the more salvation you get to experience here. We don't have, we don't have a low standard of in and out and a future thing you live through hell now. That's not the gospel. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The word from is the word ek, and it always goes from the source of the origin. From the source of faith, and then I continue to see his faith, just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But then it's like, well, then I have, I have to live by faith. That's what it says. Let's go to the next one. Galatians 3.11, but no man is justified by a law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, 38, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Man, well, it sounds like, dang, well, if I'm not living in faith, he's not going to have pleasure with me. But how many know that where it says the just shall live by faith is a quotation from the Old Testament? Next screen. Habakkuk 2, 14, where you find this, where Paul is continuing to quote this verse. This is what it says. And this is them in despair, and they're they're in a season of not hearing anything or not listening correctly to God. And the prophet writes this about the coming one, Jesus. He says this, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm, so I'm waiting, God. Nothing's going on. Things are happening. Where are you? But I'm going to wait here until you say something. When you say something, I'm going to act. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Jesus, he's coming. Speak it out, he's coming. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. Jesus, though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Then he says, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. Every time Paul says the just shall live by faith in the New Testament scripture, he's reverting back, not, not to you trying to get your own, but for originally developed, but the just shall live by his faith. Those who are justified, who are made righteous, will live by the faith of God. Wow. Check this. If it's not easy, and it's not light, it's not Jesus. Even faith. When convinced people that they're righteous, they're holy, they're blameless, they're innocent in the sight of God, that's awesome. But the same is true for faith. If you don't get all of them, you don't get the gospel. Next. You guys are right. Yeah. I showed up today, baby. And this is it, Paul never intended the emphasis to be upon what man has achieved, but instead what the Savior has accomplished on his behalf. Yes. Yes. He's not trying to say, hey, have your own faith for this and this and this. He's saying you had none. I was at the top of that game, but it's no longer I who live, but I live by the faith of God. And guess what? The just are going to live by God. Those who are really living understand righteousness and the faithfulness of God. So your faith, I'm not saying you shouldn't have faith. I'm not saying your faith isn't important. I'm saying I'm empowering it now. I'm saying you're going to encounter the love of God so much because you don't have to perform for it. The byproduct is faithfulness. And if you don't have faith today, it's okay. Look at the faithful one on the cross when you had no faith, and I guarantee you something will spark in you. Oh, my gosh. So let's talk about the faith of Christ finally, right? 
Amen. So let's go through this because there's different translations and, and verses that kind of seem to indicate where you need your own faith or faith in Christ. And it's all good, but let's do like a study too, right? I mean, even the King James, which I think it, they're all great, you know, and they have some biases and some words and not, but when you really study them out, like you get to see what they really say. And I think the King James and a lot of times actually gets the articles right. So let's see this. We've seen in Galatians 2.16. He who are Jews, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentiles or the sinners, know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So there you go, Carlos. You got to have faith in Jesus Christ to be, to be justified. Okay. So we too have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ. There it is, Carlos. It's not the faith of God. You need the faith too to get whatever justified and not by the works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But in the King James, it says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ. This is Paul celebrating. No longer I who live, but I live by the faith of the Son of God. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The word faith in Christ or faith of Christ? If it's faith in Christ, it puts you back on your faith to be the Savior. If it's faith in your righteousness, they put righteousness back on your shoulders to be your own savior. The gospel is hilarious. <laughs> this is why when I think of the gospel, I think of fun. <laughs> this is why it's good news, because it's unbelievable. <laughs> this gospel is where you lose by winning. I mean, you win by losing, I'm sorry. Come on, get it straight. Jesus wasn't a winner when he came to earth. Yeah. Not in the way people thought. They wanted him to be the David that would take over the temple and throw, overthrow the Romans, put school back, put prayer back in school and do all these things. And he didn't do that and they were disappointed. But Jesus was trying to communicate, hey, you win by losing. It's my death and in death you win. Next one. So distinct translations. Let's go to the next one. Another one right here. Popular. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Praise God. You don't have, I don't want to be found in Christ claiming my own righteousness, my own performance, which is from the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, that the righteousness which is from God by faith. So it's from God even by faith, right? Okay. That's a, that's a New King James Version, which is one of my favorites actually. But King James says, and be found in him, the original, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness you have is not by your faith, but by the faith of Christ. But if you read in, what do you do? You get more busy trying to have faith. And it's exhausting. And now we've turned faith into a work. Oh, my gosh. This crippled me for so long, man. No matter how well I did or how bad I did, it was nothing but shame. There's nothing but distance, delay, separation, more effort, more devotion, more discipline. I'm all cool with those things if they're coming from a victory. And then somebody sat me down and told me the greatest heresy ever, <laughs> that it's by the faith of God. It's not heresy, I'm just being whatever. See, the gospel... Is a joke. How amazing it is. But don't mock it by trying to earn something that's already been given to you freely through grace. Let's go to the next one. This is okay. I'm just trying to take you through. So when you read it in scripture, you're like, oh, Carlos was wrong. I'm not trying to be wrong. I'm trying to see everlasting life come out of us. All right. So this is a Mark chapter 11, verse 22, very famous verse. Um, Jesus goes, and they're talking about church, you know, uh, stuff about how we forgive people. Is it three times? Is it seven times? Jesus goes, no, 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 it's a lot more than that. And then these, uh, these the disciples are, okay. So in, um, in verse 22, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 22 to 24, it says this. Have faith in God. See, there you go, Carlos. You got to have faith in God. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you that if no, if anyone says this mountain be lifted up and thrown into the sea and has no doubt in his heart, but believes it will happen, it will be done from him. 
Have faith in God. These are in different translations. And they're probably not your more popular ones, but that doesn't make them any less valuable. And it says this, according to the Greek, in the Bible of basic English says, have God's faith. Have God's faith. In the Jewish, the, the Jewish New Testament, it says, have the kind of trust that comes from God. <laughs> it begins somewhere else. Numeric English the New Testament says, have God's faith. And the Montgomery New Testament says, take hold on God's faithfulness. In the Greek, it's saying, no, have the faith of God. You don't have to have faith in God, have the faith of him. A lot of people have faith in God and it values them nothing. But if you have God's faith, man, you can't miss it. In another rendition of this, uh, of this uh, section of scripture, they do it and what do the disciples say? Increase my faith. And Jesus goes, okay, well, here's some spiritual disciplines you got to do to increase your faith. He rebukes them. Yeah. Master, show me more faith. Increase my faith. He goes, no. If you even had a little bit of faith, you could tell that mountain to jump in the water and it would. He's not trying to tell him grow in faith. He's saying you don't have no faith. Your faith does not matter here. It's my faith. We read it as, oh, if you just have a mustard seed, what are people trying to do? Trying to gather a whole harvest just for a mustard seed. Increase my faith, teacher. Dude, if you even had a little bit, that would happen. But you don't even have that. So rest in the author and the perfecter of faith. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> but we write books on how to get a mustard seed of faith. It doesn't take very much. Have you seen a mustard seed? <laughs> the thing is you can't. The faith he's talking about, you can't. He's saying, if you had a mustard seed of my faith, that would happen. You have your faith, and it's different from mine. Let me give you my gift of faith. Wow. Next. Okay, I'm going to land the ship, hopefully. Uh, another one right here, too, common. Uh, Romans 12, uh, verse 3, in the New King James, it says, For I, through the grace given to me, to everyone, is among you, not to think of himself or his faith more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly. As God has dealt with one, the measure of faith. A lot of translations say you've been given a measure of faith, but that's not right in the translation. You've been given the same faith Jesus has. You've been given the complete measure of faith. That's why he says, don't boast. It's not from you anyway. Don't think highly of your faith more than somebody else's because it's all a gift. And everybody has been given the measure of faith. The same one Jesus had. Next. You guys are right. Man, oh, this is my favorite. Ephesians chapter 2, this is that you're saved by grace through faith, right? It says, but God, somebody say, but God. It's that God turned this around. It's because of God. He's the object here. Because God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By that grace you have been saved, raised up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that the ages to come he might show his exceeding riches of his grace and the kindness of us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that you of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not works, Lest anyone should boast. The object is God. Yeah. Or you were dead. He resurrected you without your faith. So quit boasting about the laws you're doing to get faith. So that you can boast. You can't take credit for it. That's a good thing about the gospel is that it eliminates hierarchy. Oh, I have more faith in this guy. You're going in faith this way. No, you've been given the measure of faith. And it's probably working out for you a little better because you're more aware of it. But let's get the growth, the understanding, and man, we'll be moving in the faith of Christ. You don't have a problem. You don't have a faith issue. You have the fullness of it. The measure of faith. Next. All right, cool. Dang, man, I'm going to go way over. Okay. Ah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up next week. Is that okay? Because I know you guys have kids that think it. Uh, this is a mirror uh, on uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 4 to 9. says, none of this could distract from the extravagant love of God. Your efforts and your mistakes and you trying to muss up your faith, that couldn't even distract him from the love of God. It's just, that couldn't distract the extravagant love of God. He continued to love us with the same exact intensity. This is how grace rescued us. While we were yet 
In the state of deadness and indifference in our deviations, we were, quote, quickened together with Christ. We had nothing to do with it. Grace freed us once and for all from the lies that we believed about ourselves under the performance-driven system, the law, uh, the system, and now defines our authentic identity. Go back. That's right. You're good. It's the one right there, yeah. We are co-included in his resurrection. We are also co-elevated in his ascension to be equally present in the throne room of the heavenly realm where we are co-seated with him in his executive authority. We are fully represented in Christ Jesus. In a single triumph act of righteousness, God saved us from the guttermost to the uttermost. From the guttermost to the uttermost. Here we are now. Revealed in Christ in the highest possible evelation of bliss, humanity's sad history could not distract from the extravagant love of God. For God so loved the world, not because we were faithful. No amount of faith could ever change God's mind about that. That's the whole thing. Next. Imagine how God is now able for timeless perpetu perpetuity. How you say it? Perpetuity, thank you, perpetuity, to exhibit the trophy of wealth of his grace demonstrated in the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Grace exhibits excessive evidence of the success of the cross. Your salvation is not a reward for good behavior or faith. It was a grace thing from the start to finish. You had no hand in it. Even the gift to believe simply reflects his faith. He's given you the gift of faith to believe what he's done is true. He's the author and the perfecter. It doesn't originate or flow from any other place than God, the author and the perfecter of faith. And if you get it from anywhere else or try to sustain that, you are selling cheap, my friend. We didn't invent faith. It was God's faith to begin with. It was from faith to faith, Paul says in Romans 1.17. Jesus is both the source and the conclusion of faith. If this could be accomplished through any action of yours, then we would be ground for boasting. If you got anything to it, then you can be like, you know what? I have more faith from you because I have more faith in you. I have more faith in you because you think you had something to do with it. But it's that no man should boast. Next. So the word in the Greek is pistis. When you see faith, it means pistis, faith, faithfulness. The word patheo, apatheo means unbelief or not being convinced. What does patheo mean? To be persuaded properly. Persuasion, be persuaded. To come to trust, faith. It even says this, it it's always a gift from God and never something that can be produced by people. In short, pistis, faith for the believer, is God's divine persuasion. He's the initiator of this romance. He's the beginning of it. The Lord continuously bursts faith in the yielded believer so that they can know what he prefers, the persuasion of his will. Can I get you up here, man, just to pluck it up a little bit? Uh, yeah, that's strong, so important right there. Number 4102, that's even cut and pasted right out of the strong, as you can see that. So faith doesn't even have, to, have anything to do with the ability to believe. Oh, I got to believe more. It means trust. Trust in something that already has happened. Oh, I gotta have more faith. I gotta believe harder. No, you don't. You just gotta trust more. Next. All right. So, next one. I already went to that one. He's the author and the perfecter of faith. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, this is a monstrous verse. This is a monstrous verse that nobody's ever read about. It's crazy. Not no one ever, but we never talk about this. And this is like a staple. There is one body and one spirit. Amen. Right? Just as you were called in one hope of your calling. So there's one Lord, right? There's one faith. There's one baptism. One baptism. We can have a baptism service right here and it'll be awesome. But it doesn't matter what I sprinkle you, dunk you, use a water hose, throw you in a bathtub. It's not your baptism that gets you into this. It says it's one baptism, and it was his baptism and your baptism into that death. How many know that baptism, that resurrection, doesn't happen when you say yes? It did 2,000 years ago. That's why it's good news. It already happened. But the true baptism of the spirit of, of being born again, whatever you want to call it, makes effect in you when you see his baptism as your baptism. You see, guys, 
because you say you're sorry, you confess your sin, which you should. God doesn't put Jesus back on the cross to get <laughs> re-crucified and reburied. And then, oh, somebody did it in Africa. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And they're doing this every time says, someone says a prayer. It's not becoming real. They're just engaging with the truth that preceded it. The author and the perfecter of faith. So in the same way, if you get baptized and baptized right here, it doesn't declare anything except your awareness of it. It doesn't make it real. The same thing with the one faith. There's one baptism, one God, one Lord, and one faith. And it was never about you being the, the keeper or the source of that faith. Next one. One God, one baptism, one faith. What does that say? That faith is not what we can believe about God. It's only one faith is. It's what he believes about us. <laughs> faith is not what we can believe about God and try to muster up. Faith starts with, with his belief system about you because Christ came. <sighs> Text this to everybody. God is the greatest believer of all time. God is the greatest believer of all time. And when I believe what he believes about me in the middle of my delusion, I start matching that confession. I see the fruit of faith and righteousness out of my life. Next. <laughs> and I say more. How does faith come? By hearing. And hearing of the word of God. That doesn't mean get busy reading your Bible. Yeah, that, that has a part to play, but it's the logos. When you hear Jesus, the authentic logos, when you hear this story, when you hear that it was one faith, one baptism, while you were still a sinner, that awoke in all this, you can partake in it. And faith is the recipient because I believe what I've been told. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. And it's a continual hearing. It's a continuing to see what he says about you and what happened at the cross, whether your experience has ever matched that or not. If you're religious, this will make you very mad right here. The gospel doesn't demand your faith. When you hear about it, when you were so yet a sinner, it's what produces faith. gospel does not demand faith. You better have faith or else when you hear the good news, it's what produces it. The gospel doesn't demand repentance. When you hear the gospel, it produces the mind shift. The gospel doesn't demand obedience. When you hear and let it touch your heart, it produces the obedience of Christ. And the last one is, oh, is God's persuasion and merit of his son's achievement that awakens this in mankind. But most importantly, Galatians 5, 6, faith works through love. When you see God's love for you, even when you deny it, it's faith working because his love is the initiator of that faith. He doesn't expect you to have faith so he can love you. That's not the good news. The good news is he loves you regardless of your faith. But when you understand his love, it produces a faith of Christ. And now you can start bearing the fruit of Christ, okay? Thank you guys for holding on. I know I went a little bit late, but let's just take communion real quick. Let's pass that around. If you tell people this, and they call you a heretic, just give them my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys for staying, man. I really appreciate this, seriously. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day, being here a little bit longer. But man, we're, we're getting to something. We're getting to something. I'm not here to, to preach a fake faith based on your works. I'm here to preach the faith of Christ, the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ. Just real quick, one of my buddies, John Crowder, wrote this. He says, the declaration of the gospel, the declaration, because it comes from hearing, creates faith 
in its objective truth. The inverse is not the case. Your faith does not create the fact that you are loved or included in the person and the work of Christ. The facts are the facts whether you agree with them or not. Preach the objective truth of the gospel and the subjective response of faith will just happen. Preach the objective truth of the gospel and the subjective faith will just happen. Preach faith as a price tag or a requirement salvation and you have departed from the gospel itself which is not a conduct, but an irreversible covenant of God with mankind in the incarnate Son. In fact, our faith, our faith is merely an amen to the already given yes in Christ. All the promises are yes and amen in Christ, and our part is just amen to the already yes that he has for you. you'll find the faith of God that you're learning to trust. Christian faith is not something we do that gets us connected to God or gets us into a circle of a life shared by the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Jesus Christ has done that. Faith is not something that does, faith is not something that we do that moves us from the unforgiven column to the forgiven column. Jesus did that. Faith is not something we do that gets us reconciled, justified, included, adopted, redeemed, or even saved. Jesus Christ has already done that. The fundamental, the fundamental character of the Christian faith is that of discovery. Faith, as Martin Luther said somewhere, is like an eye. An eye does not create what it sees. It sees what's there. That was Baxter Kruger right there. You see, when we take communion, it's important to know that we've all gone astray. We've all been born to a faulty system that even we defend with the vengeance sometimes. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all missed it. We've hated God. We've we've talked about it. We believe bad about him. We put um, the devil's face on him. We've done all these good things, but even when we're doing that, his love was never distracted. His love was never unpersuaded. He came directional for it. So let's just take the body. God, we thank you for the body. And we break it and say, thank you, Lord, for the good news that awakens us to what's real. I thank you for the gift of faith, the one faith, as a one baptism and one Lord. We eat that in Jesus' name. Then we take the wine. Spill it on your shirt, spill it on your carpet so you always see it or drink it. And just know that it wasn't your blood or your effort or even the blood of bulls and goats that could do this. But it was the blood of the Son of God. And he didn't do it to satisfy a bloodthirsty God. He did it to wipe our conscience clean so that we can believe the good news and have his faith. So we drink that in Jesus' name. Amen, guys. So thank you guys for sticking around, man. We love you guys so much. We'll see you next week. I'm going to bring something very similar next week. We're going to talk about what it means to be born again. What it means to be saved. Are you saved? How do you get saved? 